session is called Biohacking the Nervous System. Um, what could that possibly mean? What could it possibly mean to any of you? I'm always curious about who's here and why. A quick show of hands, who works with clients here? I assume pretty much everyone. And who would say they work in addiction? Hands up. And who would say they work in mental health? Uh, so basically most people work in everything, right? Um, so who works with the nervous system? Yeah, well, my uh, somewhat biased point of view, which I'll declare straight up, is you all work with the nervous system. So if you don't yet work with the nervous system and you work with clients and you work in mental health or behavioral health, um, there's something in this hour for you and for your clients, I hope. Now, the other side of this is uh, if we work with the nervous system, the nervous system is not a concept. It's an actual physical thing in your body. So it's kind of like bioengineering. And if you're working with a physical thing, why aren't we working with technology that can measure and intervene and help us work with a physical thing? So to answer the questions about how technology can be useful with the nervous system, I think first we have to look a little bit about why we would talk about working with the nervous system at all. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to do is make a link from working with clients, working with behavior, working with mental health, through into the nervous system, through into technology, and back again. Is there anyone who wants to leave now? <laughs> There's the people sitting near the door. If you want to leave, just wave, and I'll know I'm off track, and I'll try and do something else. Um, so that's where I'm going to begin. I'll do about 20 minutes just talking you through some slides up here. And we'll hopefully do 20 minutes of demonstrating the theory in a pseudo session with a volunteer while watching the session with the physio cam, which hopefully will reveal the neural regulation during the session. Very ambitious, and it'll probably go wrong, but never mind. Uh, so think about if there's anyone, as you're watching me talk about this, think about if you are interested in being a volunteer for this session. And if so, I will call you up, and we'll, we'll explore that. Um, so one of the interesting uh, little phrases that people told me about addiction care or, or recovery is that actually staying sober is easy. You just have to not drink between meetings. Anyone heard that one? And it's very true, of course. Of course it's true. Um, but the question is, why is that true? What's, what's the hidden intelligence in that statement? What is it about going to a meeting that returns you to somewhere that you've drifted from that means you have to go to a meeting? So that's kind of the point, isn't it? That there's something that happens at a meeting which gets you from a place where relapse might be more likely to a place where relapse is less likely. Uh, I'm sure many people in this room have many theories about that, but let's have a quick look at it from the point of view of the nervous system. Can you guys see if I stand here? Who am I, who am I in the way of? Everyone. Right, um, maybe I'll go over here, but then I'm sort of away from you all. Never mind. Um, so this is uh, kind of the world of health through diagrams about the nervous system. If you're curious about this, you can have a, a look more in depth in my book here, which you might notice. Um, but I'm just going to take you through these diagrams here. Uh, these ones up here relate to the three areas of healthcare that we really know about are body, mind, and spirit. Okay? So this is, a exam this is a really a diagram of your brain, which is disagreeing with itself because its prefrontal cortex, its mammal system, and its reptile system are out of sync. Now, this is pretty much the case for every dysregulated nervous system. Sometimes we call this trauma, sometimes we call it PTSD, sometimes we just call it life. Uh, but this is pretty much how humans have come into not being the same as our animal cousins. Uh, this is, I can't really, I haven't got time to explain all of this, but take it from me that the blue is a dysregulated nervous system in your body. If you were a gazelle, this, this line would look like the dotted line there and everything would be fine. You'd respond to threat, evenly you come up, if you survive it comes down. If you don't do that, you end up like this. So, what that brings you into is um, a state of being which is essentially what we'll call a dysregulated nervous system. And this is the piece of your nervous system which is not yet finished responding to an earlier threat. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but there's something about a threat that was earlier than now 
that was overwhelming enough to leave some unfinished business. And I don't mean kind of in terms of thoughts or memories. I mean really in terms of the physiology's response to threat. And we all know that physiology responds very strongly to threat. So it should go up, it should come down. If it's not all the way down, you're left with something. And we call this baggage. It's a very conventional idea that people are carrying around their baggage. Now, if you, if you take that on board as the kind of state of being that we're in, what happens next? What happens to us as we wander around life? Shout out, feel free. Get triggered. You know, stuff happens, really. You know, life happens. So here is life happening to a dysregulated nervous system. Uh, what would you expect to happen next? Uh, well, it's interesting to see whether you would even complete your response to this new threat. And if not, then you're adding more dysregulation. But the answer is, of course, there's some kind of response to this, some kind of reaction. And it looks like this sometimes, which is an overreaction. Now, you'll notice that the red arrow is much bigger than the green arrow. So you might say the green arrow is maybe a 3 out of 10 trigger, and the red arrow is maybe a 9 out of 10 reaction. And what's that going to look like if you can't see the baggage? It looks like an overreaction, right? Now, is there a mental health classification for people who have overreactions? Is it called borderline personality disorder, for example, or many other things? But the, the other, there's another thing that can happen when you, when you feel like you're going to have an overreaction, and that feels very threatening, because big reactions in the body can be distressing for people who uh, don't feel that that's OK, is you can have this kind of reaction, which is an underreaction. So this is a reaction where you want to explode, but you wall it all in. Right? So you've got effectively two ways that a nervous system that's dysregulated can respond to a trigger in the here and now. One is to over-respond, and one is to under-respond. But you very rarely get it just right. If you do, this is your Goldilocks nervous system here. Right? So you'll notice here that there really isn't any baggage at all. So you get a 3 out of 10 problem and you get a 3 out of 10 reaction. And what's it like to be around that person? Can you collaborate with that person? Can you solve problems with that person? Can you solve problems with other people when you are that person? Who would like to be this person every day in the consulting room with their clients? Yeah? So this is, this is your ideal therapist nervous system. Uh, who in this room doesn't have baggage? Thank God. So scary when people put their hand up to that question. <laughs> right, so, the, so you've got a problem here. And you've got a problem, every individual, every human has a problem, which is that in order to get along best in life, this wants to be your way of being. But we've got, a th we've got this third thing in the middle which gets in the way. And you can only see it on the inside. You can't see it on the outside. From the outside, all you can see is there's nothing going on or there's too much going on. So the question is, what do we do about it? Right? Uh, you'll notice there's only three lines on this drawing. Right? There's a trigger, there's a baggage, there's a reaction. So there's only three things you can do to change this picture. And we'll take them in turn. That is a trigger which is being reduced. What do you think we would call the blue line? A boundary. Now, if you work in addiction treatment, you'll hear the word boundary, boundary, boundary forever. But do we ever really think accurately about what it's a boundary to and from? So if you notice that there's an over or under reaction, then by definition, there's been a trigger. right? So if there's been a trigger, the trigger is always something really simple. It is always something you saw or something you heard, maybe something you felt. But it's, a, it's information coming to the senses. So it's not you're being an asshole, right? It's you left your coffee cup on the table that I just cleaned up. So triggers are really specific. And, it, and the more specific you can get with them, the easier it is to do this thing called a boundary. So a boundary is really just a way of trying to manage triggers in your environment. But for who? Who are you managing boundaries for? You're managing boundaries for your dysregulation. So a boundary is never, should never be 
a, an imposition on another person. It should be a declaration of self-care, if I could put it like that. Uh, you know, quite often we're tempted to say, it's all your fault, you've come across my boundaries. But really what's happened is I've failed to take subsequent action to make sure my boundaries stay in place for me, if that makes sense. Um, so if you do successfully mediate your boundaries, you might take this down from a 3 out of 10 to maybe a 1 out of 10. It's still going to hit your baggage, your unfinished business, something very similar to this in the past or something similar to this a thousand times in the past. And you might have a kind of 6 out of 10 reaction here, which is improvement. We've gone from 3 to 9 to 3 to 6. So what else could we do? Uh, here's another blue line stopping my reaction going all the way out. What would you call that? Gatekeeping, there you go. Anything else? Any other suggestions? Self-restraint. A container. Yeah, I call this containment. I mean, it's really just a boundary in reverse. Right? There's nothing particularly com complicated about this. But if you call it containment, then you know that you're talking about containing something in rather than keeping something out. So the idea here is that let's say I'm now down to a 6 out of 10 reaction. I can somehow turn that into a 3 out of 10 reaction. And what does that look like in the real world? Any suggestions? Self-talk. Self well, here's an example. Instead of calling you an arsehole, I could say, I feel like calling you an arsehole. Right? Do you see the difference? So this takes this. <laughs> yeah. But this takes a desire to do it and then a little bit of vigilance. So if you're already in a 9 out of 10, you're not going to do it. Right? You're just going to go around calling people assholes all day long. But if you manage to keep some lid on it, you might have a chance. Um, the advantage is what you end up with, of course, is 3 out of 10 into the system, 3 out of 10 out of the system. And notice you don't have 9 out of 10 coming out, and you don't have 0 out of 10 coming out. So you're actually simulating a perfect nervous system. Now, what's the point of doing this? Can we survive? Well, well yeah, maybe. It depends what context you're in. But really, we can come back to my earlier story. What is the point of going to a 12-step meeting? Regulation. Regulation is a word that we now use and we understand a lot. Regulation is really about managing the dysregulation or the bad baggage in the nervous system. What happens in a 12-step meeting? Do we have boundaries? Yes, you know, there's a very regulated format for how we can talk and what people can say at us. Right? People can't really say anything at us. And in the meetings that I'm familiar with, there's this idea that you really can't comment on other people's stuff. Right? So that it's very boundaried. It's like it, you, know, you go around and turn, people don't interrupt and people don't talk about you. And is there containment? Can you just do and say anything you want? No. So it's a way of experiencing other nervous systems near you without getting triggered, but without losing connection. Right? So you neither have to shut down, nor do you have to explode. And in that middle place, you can achieve this thing called co-regulation, where nervous systems actually settle because they have safe intimacy. So what happens if you fail with your boundaries or with your containment? Let's see what happens if you fail with your containment. What happens if you just call the person an arsehole instead of acknowledging that you think you feel like they're an arsehole? Well, I think it's like a soap bubble. So if you put a pinprick in it, the whole thing evaporates. And you might notice this, that if you lose your temper with someone, you no longer have the capacity to really, in the moment, know what's OK for you and what isn't OK for you. Because that's really what a boundary is. What's OK for my nervous system? What isn't OK for my nervous system? What do I need to do about it? So these two things, I think, go together. And the advantage of doing it well is that you can begin to build what I would call an internal set of boundaries and containment around your baggage. And that's the third piece of work. So the third piece of work is starting to do work with the somatic, with the body. So all the things that people now talk about are working with body-based psychologies actually requires someone to be stable enough and safe enough and contained enough and boundaried enough 
to do that. So when people come into residential therapy, they kind of get that in spades from the building. But when people have to do this for themselves outpatient, that has to be something they build for themselves. So this idea, again, of you can stay sober as long as you don't drink between meetings. If you're beginning to lose your boundaries, lose your containment, go to an environment where that's modeled for you, and you'll take a little bit of that on on the inside. Now, this is also a model of attachment. So this is what a mother or caregiver does for a child. So you can see that that is the idea. So if this is the case, then you can go from this person, right? If you zoom all the way back from that picture, it looks exactly like this person. Notice that? Anyone baffled by that? I wish I had a better graphic here. We could just zoom out. Imagine me zooming out, and you end up there. So the, the trick to being regulated is actually to begin to simulate regulation, and then you might internally, organically catch up with it. As you notice, people do if they keep going to meetings. Eventually, something shifts on the inside, and they feel better. Now, you can do something to accelerate that somatic work, but the key thing is that the body already knows what to do. So the reptile and the mammal brain have been doing this for about 100 million years without your help, and they still know how to do it. What you need to do is get yourself out of the way. That's the key thing to working with the nervous system, is actually to educate the prefrontal cortex to get out of the way of the system that already knows what it's doing. Now, on that topic, wouldn't it be useful, therefore, to be able to measure regulation live during a session to see if you could bring a person out of dysregulation into regulation? Please say yes. Thank you. Uh, so it turns out that a man called Stephen Porges, who's one of the great experts at the nervous system, has invented a device which can measure the nervous system using nothing more than a camera. And this first laboratory prototype that's ever been allowed out of the laboratory is on this table in front of you right now. What I would love for my magic trick is a willing volunteer. I have a volunteer here. So what I'm going to ask you to do is bring up something which has dysregulated you recently. Can you do that? Yeah. Do you have something? Yeah. Come on up. Uh, there we go. What's your name? Aisha. Aisha. Nice to meet you. Can you sit here? Yes. Now, I'm going to turn this on, and then we're going to fiddle with the microphone and things. Um, and I'm just hoping this is going to work. Would you do me a favor and just look at that camera until I sit down? And I'm hoping that this is going to pick it out of that background. It's not. Um, there you go, yeah. Just keep looking at that camera. And what I'm going to do is while you do that, I'm going to give you this mic and I'm going to use that handheld mic. So, it takes about two minutes just to set up, so nothing's really happening. Can I just yes, bring this on the arm? Thanks, Peter. And just lift up your arm. Thank you. OK, so Aisha, can you, um, you can probably now just look at me if you like. Okay. Uh, so tell me what has come up that has dysregulated you in the last 24, 40 hours. Um, I was walking and I was hit by a cyclist from mm -hmm. the back, okay. fell flat on my face okay. and broke a tooth. <gasps> no, that's terrible. Yes. Right. Well, this is a pretty big trigger. Yeah. yeah, this is a real thing in the here and now. Yeah. So what did you do next? How did you react to this? I was in shock. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what happened. and. Mm -hmm. I think I just I was just there on the floor. I didn't even have a chance to, you know, um, like if I had known it was coming, I mm -hmm. would have put my hands out. And, sure. But I didn't have a chance to react. I just right. went flat, and I was stunned. So people came and they mm -hmm. helped me up. And then the first thing I noticed was that I had blood on my shirt and my mouth, and mm -hmm. you know, touched it, and so it was like again in shock yeah. and then, you know, I felt like I, I didn't have the tooth, like I swallowed something, mm -hmm. so I had actually swallowed my tooth. Mm -hmm. 
and the cyclist just went off. Right. So um, yeah, so I had to rush to the dentist and um, get get the rest of it extracted. Okay. Um, he glued on a fake tooth, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so it was quite traumatic. So let me ask you about how you feel about the cyclist going away. Very angry. Yeah. I felt. Um, you know, like you fucking asshole. And yeah, yeah. There was a part of me. It's okay. That, Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I and I just felt like you know what is this? Like there's no sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. my dentist was saying that um, maybe the business is close by, have CCTV, mm -hmm. and you can go and ask. So let me take you back to the yes. cyclist. If he had stayed, what would you have said to him? I mean, it depends. If he was apologetic. Okay. Just, just your initial instinct. What would it have been? You need to pay for it. Yeah, this. yeah, okay. Yeah, so there would have been a strong reaction at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And how does it feel to think about being allowed to have that expression? That, that if was I denied was, to you, yeah. Yeah, if I was actually able to say yeah, yeah. it, um, I think I would have felt relief. So how does it feel right now? How to conjure up this image of him staying and you being able to tell him, Give him quite a strong reaction. I mean, this is not a three out of ten problem. This is maybe yeah. a six out of ten. Yeah. So you had a reaction you wanted to give voice to, or to really give body to. Yeah. And it would have been about a six out of ten. Yeah, I would have just said, you know, this is ju just the height of irresponsibility. First of all, mm -hmm. you went past me. You didn't even stop. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you were on the footpath. You were supposed to be on the goddamn road. Mm -hmm. um, and then. You know, now this is like, this is going to cost me 2,500 euros, which mm -hmm. I don't have. So you need to pay for this. Like, you need to take responsibility for now, this. That sounds like a pretty measured response. Yeah. Pretty boundary <laughs> response. Yeah. Uh, what would you have said if you had not been so measured? I would have smacked him once. Yeah, there you go. See? So there's, there's part of your body response. So you notice there's all these different responses. They're actually coming from those different parts of your brain. Yeah. It's a part of your brain that wants to complete your response to this threat by smacking him one. And smashing his cycle. Smashing his cycle, great strategy. And then jumping on it. Jumping on it. Breaking it apart. Feel it. <laughs> yeah. Taking parts of it. Yes. Um, taking the handle, stuffing it down his neck. Yes. Should I go on? Yes. <laughs> definitely. This is definitely helping. Yeah. <sighs> See, I'm actually, side. I feel like my blood pressure is rising as I yes, talk about that's it. That's okay. Let yeah. it rise. Let the body do what it wants to do. The yeah. body knows what it needs to yeah. do to recover from this event. Right? So interestingly, let's assume you've done all these things and you then reflect on this a week and a half later as you receive a visit from the constabulary yeah. asking you to explain your actions on the day. Yeah. Um, and you look back on that, and do you think this was the right response, the appropriate response? Well, given the fact that we live in a society with mm -hmm. rules, and um, an officer has now shown up sure. at my door, so, so it's like I... There might I, be I a reason have, for that, is that, yeah. you know, this guy might have just made a mistake, and it's yeah. an accident, and... So, and just, you know, because what I'm trying to tease out here is what it feels like is a reaction to something that has happened before this event, yeah. as well as what has happened during this event. Yeah, well, what, what happened was that I felt like I wasn't in control. Mm -hmm. And there was a part of me that was actually feeling like, um, feeling very helpless, mm -hmm. that um, even okay, my so body didn't know what to do. As you're sitting here talking about feeling helpless, what do you notice in your body? Fear. Do you notice any sensation in your body right um, now? Any place in your body that you notice sensation? Right now? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, in my heart. Okay, so kind of here? Yeah, here, and it goes down my left arm. Okay, down your left arm. Yeah. So what do you feel down the left arm there? A tightness, tightness. and tingling. Yeah. Okay. What color is it? Green. And what temperature is it? 99.9 uh, .9 Fahrenheit degrees. Right, it's a really hot green tingling in your left arm. And if you just spend a moment with that, I'm not going to take you too deep into this, but just spend a moment with that. And think about doing a thing that I might call time traveling. Mm -hmm. So take the sensation back in time. Not the story, but the sensation. And just 
see what comes to mind, if anything. This sensation of feeling? Yeah, the sensation in the arm, the, the very hot green sensation goes back in time. Oh. Let's see where this takes you back to. The audience will probably notice that there's an <coughs> indication on the physio cam this is taking you back to something more dysregulating mm -hmm. than talking to me. If you don't want to talk about it, it's okay, because mm. I know we're in an audience here. It's taking you somewhere, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about it, or do you want to keep it to yourself? Um, actually, I thought of several in incidences and different mm -hmm. stages of my life. It would be fair to call that like a stack of pancakes. Mm -hmm. So the time traveling goes one and then another and then another and then another. Mm -hmm. They're all examples of your nervous system not finishing a response to threat in the same channel, mm -hmm. I'm suggesting. Is there any one of those that you'd feel safe to talk about? Not really. Okay, and that's fine. It's really great. That's a great boundary right there. I would give you a round of applause if I had a free hand. Um, but you notice that, there. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so it's quite interesting because, uh, sorry to interrupt our connection, but I'm just also trying to demonstrate the technology here. That we, we've been holding you in quite a regulated place, and then I invited you into your somatic dysregulation, and it took you back somewhere. And then I kind of gave you permission not to go with it, and you sort of came back to here and now, and that actually registered on the equipment. Um, so what I'd like you to do, without telling the story, I want you to just go to go to one of the earlier examples mm. and I want you to stay there somatically and just see if you can notice any change in the sensation in your body. So you're going back to the sensation, maybe it's that hot green arm, mm. back to a place in time. And I'm curious about whether there's any change in sensation. Okay. But you've gone to an earlier event. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from the perspective of that earlier event, I'd like you to tell me, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much you want to react to the cyclist today? Mm, two. Two. And if I'd asked you that 15 minutes ago, or 10 minutes ago, which I should have done, what would you have said? Probably 9, 8 okay. or 9. So, I actually have no idea what time it is. We don't have a clock in here. But I think I need to stop and return to the audience. Would you feel comfortable stopping at this point? Yes. Is there anything you'd like to finish with, or are you okay? Do you feel regulated? Yeah. And actually, I was, I was controlled uh, despite, because, despite our conversation, mm. because there's a part of me that's very conscious, and mm -hmm. there's a part of me that's very self-conscious, and sure. there's a part of me that knows that you know, everybody's watching, and there's a camera yeah, yeah, there, yeah. and I'm sitting next to a stranger, Good. and I'm talking to... So it's like all these parts of me felt like, okay, I want to guard myself, mm -hmm. I want to guard myself. And then there was a part saying, well, I volunteered as well. So, mm -hmm. so it was trying to like navigate the boundary as well. Um, Interestingly, despite all those gymnastics in your brain, your body knew what it wanted to do and did it. Yeah. And you went from a 9 out of 10 to a 2 out of 10. Yeah. In 10 minutes with a stranger in front of an audience. Yeah. Imagine what you could do in an hour with someone you like without an audience. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a gift. Thank you. For Thank you so much. <laughs> Oops, sorry. There goes the mic. Um, so does anyone know what time it is? Okay, what time am I supposed to finish? Oh, we've got loads of time. Great. Um, okay, I've got even got time to put this mic on. Thank you so much. Is this mic on? Is it working? Can anyone hear this mic? I got it in the right place? Maybe it needs to go in the middle. Okay. So, um, yeah, great. We've got loads of time. 
Um, I'm going to show you quickly what I believe just happened. Uh, to get out of all of your way, I can probably move these chairs. And so this is um, the final part of the book where we talk about actual treatment. Uh, the premise is that you basically got a dysregulated nervous system, which is modeled like this, but could be shut down. You apply boundaries and containment to it. Did I do that in that session? Did anyone hear any adding of boundaries and containment to that material? Yeah, what did you hear? Sorry, do you mind if we talk about this? Are you OK? Please, please go ahead. If there's anything you don't want anyone to talk about, just give me a wave and I'll shut it down. I can talk about a million different other things. No, I'm curious as well. Okay. So you were saying you saw an example of boundaries and containment. Yeah. I'm asking whether, whether it's OK to talk about it. OK, yeah, that's a good example. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it kind of becomes a habit. <laughs> um, I think in the session when I said, and so, you know, 10 days' time and the police come and ask you, do you reflect on this and think, well, actually, that was fine? And the answer was actually, you know, maybe it's not so good. So even in a situation like that, I mean, the important thing to notice is that the red and green arrow just have to be the same size. If it's a very big green arrow, a very big red arrow is right. Um, but it's still, you can still go too far. And I think you know, beating up a, a stranger in a traffic accident is usually considered <laughs> to be adding something from the past to what has happened, despite the fact that it is, a, you know, unusually, for many of the stories we hear in the consulting room, that's such a real danger to the body. Um, so there was some idea about uh, containment, actually. There wasn't really much of an example of boundaries. There. I mean, a boundary would be a bit like you were saying at the beginning, you know, could you, be, could you watch where you're going, please? Um, that, that's an example of a boundary. And you take that example further in clinical practice, you might say, well, in future, what I need to do is make sure people watch where they're going, so I'm going to wear a bright orange vest and only walk on pavements next to walls, or whatever it might be. So you can see the catch in boundaries is that saying, I, the boundary I need is that all of you drive your bicycles differently, which is totally disempowering and doesn't help your nervous system. Because you may have a different nervous system to other people. And we can't all drive our bicycles for every possible nervous system. So then the interesting next piece, I'm really in everyone's way, aren't I? Is, uh, and you can't really see these pictures, can you? You see that one better? Um, so we started to look at this thing, which is basically the invisible lion, which is we're looking at where does the extra material come from in the here and now? You know, why am I turning a 2 out of 10 into a 9 out of 10? What is it? Because it feels like it's real. We can't quite see it, and it is here. It really is here in your body right now. To find that, you just have to expand your window of awareness back to the past. But you can't do that with your prefrontal cortex. So the entire history of talk therapy has been a project that could never work to do this, because you cannot use your prefrontal cortex to find the unfinished sensations in your body. You can try, but it's like uh, filling out the tire on your car to fix a problem with the radiator fluid. It's all in the same place, but these are different systems. So you probably noticed that we explored sensation and invited her to time travel with the sensation. Was that pretty obvious? Yeah, it's pretty clear. And <clears throat> what was the result? I mean, what's interesting is even without telling a story, even without going into the narrative, even without uh, you know, endlessly rehashing what happened, the body had permission to start doing what it has known how to do for 100 million years, which is to actually, instead of cycling in unfinished response to something from earlier, settle into a little bit of discharge and calm. Now, I'm not saying her entire history in her nervous system was discharged in that 10 minutes. But in relation to what was wiggling around as we discussed it, something just kind of dropped a bit and settled. I'm, I'm talking for you, but would you say that's correct? Yeah. yeah. So something just dropped and settled a bit. And then we were able to revisit this diagram and you know, ask, what, what is the output? And it was 2 out of 10 instead of, did you say 9 out of 10? Yeah. So from what kind of therapy can you do with someone? 
that takes them from a 9 out of 10 scale of activation to a 2 out of 10 activation in 10 minutes. Not much. My experience in 12-step meetings is that that'll do it for me. Has anyone had that experience? It takes a lot of other people in about an hour. It's very kind of them to show up to regulate my nervous system. Um, so that, you know, hence my story about what do we need to do to stay out of behaviors that we don't wish to do. We have to stay out of them in between uh, meetings, which is the same as saying in between regulating our nervous system, which is the same as saying in between paying attention to our mammal and our reptile system. So that's the why. Let's talk about the how. I'm really sorry for people who were over there who couldn't see the color on this system. I quite wanted to get that projected on the screen, but it was a technical challenge beyond us. For those of you that, I had to see it as well, that's the only problem. For those of you that could see it, what did you see? This is a screen that went from red to green through yellow. What did you notice, if anything? Yeah? So you notice the correlation between what looked like, if you like, activation in the system and a color which was more red, and what looked like being more settled and a color that was more green. What I noticed is that when I asked you to go inside and start looking for activation in the physiology, the color went from green towards the red spectrum. Did anyone else notice that? Yeah. yeah? So it was, um, it was, it seemed to be very much connected with the physiology because when we were talking and connecting, we came into green from the beginning. Just, I'll tell you about how this all works in a minute. But the, so you're in the green, and then you start to flirt with the edge of dysregulation. It seemed to go to red. And if you're a clinician working with this, maybe you can look at the screen and you can say, OK, you know, my client's going a bit that way, which we're supposed to be able to know anyway because we're trained to do that. But what if we don't? And then you say, OK, we're into the red. Maybe we're just pull it back to the green and see what we can do. And I was able to notice that during the session, uh, Aisha was going from red to green and red to green and red to green, exactly as I wanted. So I was very lucky, uh, actually, that the, the client's response really matched my intention. Um, so are you curious at all about what this equipment is? Yes. Or is that just not interesting to a bunch of relational therapists who want to talk about <laughs> stories and people? OK, so over here is, are we finished with this? Oh, I just give it, well, I'll do that at the end. Um, so the, the camera is actually a rather old school piece of kit, which is a sort of previous generation camera, which uh, looks at the world in terms of many, many pixels on a square. It creates a large bandwidth of um, output which is not very popular for things like mobile phones because it's a, a, a large signal to manage. So modern cameras tend to amalgamate signals in the chip. And so you lose a lot of the pixelation. So the reason why the camera's like this is because it's the individual pixels in a person's face which reveal the way the blood is flowing through their veins. And believe it or not, that camera, even with that muddy background and muddy lighting uh, on a darker colored skin, was picking out individual pixels on Aisha's face and forehead and watching a, somewhere between 10 and 50 times a second the change in color of that pixel. And from that, it builds a pulse wave, very accurate pulse wave, much more accurate than a Fitbit or an iPhone watch. Um, and so then you have a picture of a person's pulse. It's called the orbital pulse wave because it's the pulse away from the heart. And why is that useful? Because your nervous system is effectively an accelerator and a brake. You've got two channels of uh, braking, which is the ventral and the dorsal vagus nerve. One channel of acceleration of the sympathetic nervous system is often called the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. It's basically an accelerator and a brake. And if you think about life, that's 
how you receive the world, you respond by activating or relaxing. So when you do that, things change in your body. Obviously, that's the whole point of it. Um, it changes the dilation of your capillaries, which is called your vasomotor constriction, and it changes your heart rate. So obviously, if you're confronted with a threat, you need to beat your heart faster. So if you have the heart, the pulse wave, then you have to deconstruct that into what signals were put into the heart to make it beat that way. And if you're Stephen Porges and you're a genius and you've been doing this for 40 years, you know how to do that. If you're me, you don't. But if you are him, you do. And this is what they did in his lab. So they basically take the pulse wave, which you can also get by putting a sensor on your earlobe or on your finger, uh, and they deconstruct it into what we call neural variables. <laughs> And the neural variables will tell you the activation in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So on the screen here, we had a visual representation of something called RSA, which I think is rhythmic sinus arrhythmia, is it? Resting sinus, one of those. Um, and it's a measure of the parasympathetic nervous system. So what you saw was someone coming into social connection, dropping in a bit, going more green, and then, being, and then challenging their system into more activation and going red. And it, it kind of intuitively matched your observation of what we were doing, didn't it? So anyone who thought, what on earth, these two things seem to have nothing to do with each other? It'd feel pretty good. You did. You were, I, was, yeah. I could actually like, feel the red. And yeah. It's, it's weird to say that, but yeah, I, yeah, I could yeah. actually you know, like, very viscerally feel the yeah. red. Well, it's an interesting thing. If, you, if we'd had this set up so you could see it, uh, quite often people say that it feels quite validating because you're getting a technology to validate you in a way that you, we usually use people to validate us. You go, oh, I can see that you're quite upset now. Yes, you know, I am, and now I feel seen and heard. Weirdly, you can feel seen and heard by a laptop screen. I've had that experience. I mean, the, the first people to experiment with this outside of the lab were my children. So I just said, come here, I've got this new kit. Sit down, I'm going to watch you doing something with it. I watched one of my children watching Britain's Got Talent, and I could tell her when she liked the act and when she didn't, and this was really freaking her out. So uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. There's a lot of other things we can do with it. Uh, what we don't have any idea at all yet is how to use this in clinical practice, whether it's useful in clinical practice, or whether or not it's a good idea to use in clinical practice. Uh, and Stephen Porges is not a clinician. He's an academic and an anatomist and a biophysiologist. Um, and he you know, works with all the master clinicians in the world in this area. We've been trialing it a little bit in Chiron House, haven't we, Tracy? Uh, do you want to say anything about that? Um, We've just been using it with therapists, talking to therapists, yeah. haven't we? We haven't even dared use it on any clients yet. We have quite a severe population. The, the, so the we <laughs> and then bring back into, oh, okay, now I've regulated him again. And it's kind of, it's, it's just really interesting to work with. And I must say, I'm really looking forward to actually starting working with, with clients and, and letting them see what their own system's doing. Because we, we, we're using psychic information to say this is what your system's doing, but to actually have a visual look, you see, you just regulated right now. Look, mm. you've managed to bring them. And at Chiron House, we've got two in the room. So you've got the therapist and the client on the system. So each can see each other's nervous system, which is a huge risk for therapists. It's freaking everyone out. Um, but this was suggested by a lady called Deb Dana. Has anyone heard of Deb Dana? She's Stephen Porges' master clinician who's interpreting his work for therapists. And the idea really is that the, ultimately the goal of working with the nervous system is to bring regulation, and regulation is really brought about through co-regulation. I mean, that diagram I showed you earlier of the two circles, you could think of therapy in the therapeutic space as the blue circle, 
and the client's nervous system is the red circle. Uh, so you want to build them in a kind of nested model of regulation. Um, are there any more questions about the technology? I mean, I could talk about it all day long, but it gets a bit nerdy. Did you just ask, were you consciously yeah. attempting pendulation? Were you kicking your back and forth? No, I wasn't really. I was just uh, consciously attempting this whole piece here, which is, you know, let's reframe your experience. Because the idea is when you reframe it, you're left with some residue red arrow, right? Because you can't beat the person up. So you're left with that feeling, the impulse and then use that to find something earlier and just allow the body to do its thing. Uh, and what I, you know, I noticed that the I mean, pendulation is all, you know, for most people, for many people who are you know, sufficiently uh, regulated, it's kind of automatic. I mean, this, this limbic system is a master of resolving physiology. And the other thing to say, I, mean, I was a bit cheeky at the beginning when I said, you know, there's no such thing as talk therapy or mental health or behavioral, it's all nervous system. But it's what it is, it's a chain of dominoes. So it be, the, the chain of dominoes begins with a nervous system impulse, which is a cue to safety or threat. And then there's a whole series of dominoes which goes through the body, as you'd expect. And down towards the end of the dominoes are things like thoughts. So you've got a sense of reality shift here where you've invented an invisible line. That's going to change your whole sense of reality, everything you think. Uh, this is going to change your relationships, how people relate to you. Um, and of course, there's a kind of biochemical consequence as well, because there is to everything in the body. So something like anxiety can be reframed as I'm running away from an invisible lion. Um, there's a story that's actually at the beginning of the book, which is, you know, there's a guy running down the street and he's waving wildly, screaming, he's half naked, and you think, what do you think of this guy? What do you think he's crazy? And do you avoid him? Of course you avoid him. And then you see a lion come around the corner and chasing him. Now what do you think? You think he's normal, and you might even help him if you had a rifle. The important thing in that story is the guy is exactly the same, biologically identical in his behavior. One of those stories is called mental illness. The other one is called responding appropriately to a lion. That's just the difference of the green arrow, right? The red arrow is a perfectly functioning body if you're being chased by a lion. So, you know, and the, the corollary, of course, is being shut down. So you've got anxiety and depression on that scale and pretty much everything in between. And if you want to pull around an accelerator and a brake and you can't do it from the inside out comfortably, how do you do it? If you can't do it from inside, what are your options to pull your accelerator and brake from the outside? Well, that's actually helping you to pull it from the inside through the outside. But obviously, we use, ex we use uppers and downers on the outside of our bodies all the time. Right? This entire conference is born out of an industry of trying to help people who've overdone it with things that go up and things that go down. But even in just what we consider the normal real world, what is the size of the global industry of alcohol and coffee? Do we use these things much? Do we think about them and talk about them all the time? Rarely anything else. I mean, who, how many people on this planet get through their week without using something to speed them up or slow them down? So we're very poorly regulated. We're not living in our bodies. It's not going very well. There's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, and what I was what I'm, you know, trying to kind of leave you with today is the idea that really, if we're doing mental health work, if we're doing behavioral health work, if we don't know what we don't know about the nervous system, then we haven't yet begun. And it's fine for someone, for example, to read my book and tell me I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. What concerns me is when people don't know that there's that material there to engage with and to disagree with or agree with. Um, so that's the work we do at the clinic. And it always begins with psychoeducation. That's why I wrote the book. This isn't necessarily a shameless plug for the book. If you can't afford a book, I'll send you one for free. Because I think that the most important thing isn't that everyone agrees with me, but that people have an opportunity to disagree, debate, and start a conversation about nervous system health rather than just mental health and behavioral health. Now, we've got a few minutes left, so why don't we take some questions? We can use a microphone if we like, and think about 
whether or not any of you are interested in this technology and what you might make of it. Here you go. Thank you so much. I was just thinking back to what you were saying about that talk therapy might not necessarily be, you know, the, the best way to um, deal with, you know, these issues of deep-rooted trauma or what you call the invisible lion. So what about, what about things like hypnotherapy, for instance, that... Uh well, can I broaden your question to what in the history of humanity has addressed regulating the nervous system? Right. Uh, the interesting thing is that things people were doing thousands of years ago, we now look at as being very good at something in medicine, like mindfulness plus anything is your latest doctor's prescription for everything. And of course, th these were things that were all junked during the age of reason as being superstition and spirituality and religion and nonsense and madness. And then we became anatomists and we found out how everything worked and then we developed machines to measure it all. And we've arrived at the conclusion that what we really need to do is quieten the nervous system and allow it to regulate itself. So. There are many, many things which I think historically have been intuitively understood, perhaps at the beginning by mystics and then by people who are very embodied, to be helpful in returning the nervous system to regulation. I'm not going to comment on hypnotherapy, I don't really know. Um, but that, that, there's certainly, the wisdom of the body is much greater than the wisdom of the mind. The mind is an excellent blunt tool for building houses and turning on the heating, but it's left us powerfully unhealthy as a species. Thank you. Um, just a question on uh, co-regulation that you mentioned yeah. earlier, with the two um, mm. monitoring systems going on at the time. Can you tell yeah. us a bit more about that? How you use uh, that clinically? That I could do. I mean, I could do another day on that. Uh, this is the problem. Take one of those models and put it next to another model, and you have a relationship. Now, those of you who are uh, in this field will know that it's often relationships that bring people into therapy, right? So often you start with, why are these two nervous systems not having a happy life together? Well, it's because they're two of those rather than two of those. Um, so if you can imagine getting individuals regulated, then relationships work better. Um, so co-regulation is when you're you're really able to piggyback on someone else's regulation a bit. Not too much, not over. I mean, a bit like you know, a therapy client session. We, we had that model of the, the regulated system with the small dot. That would offer a lot of regulation to someone coming into contact with that person for 10, 15 minutes, an hour. But you can't live your whole life like that because the person with the small dot would eventually get overwhelmed and move away. So the idea is that everyone's working on their own stuff. You know, we talk about keep your side of the street clean. And then there's an opportunity to meet. And when you have safe intimacy, something rather wonderful does happen for mammals, which is that they actually feel safer when they're connected. So the body has a binary pathway between fight and flight and social engagement. And if you go into social engagement from activation in fight flight, which I think is what happens in a good 12-step meeting, you come into collaboration and cooperation versus competition. And there you find that you feel safer. Amazingly, you've got 20 friends who are going to help you in your life. Of course you feel safer. You're a better resource. Uh, I have an epilogue for all of this, which is if the world is made up of these nervous systems here, full of baggage, or react, overreacting or underreacting, what is the felt experience of life? So if you're walking through life, a big red mess, and you're expecting green triggers to come, and you expect them to feel like they're much bigger than they are. What's your prevailing attitude to life? What's your, what's your emotion as you go around the world? Aggression, Aggression is a response to fear. Fear is the word I'm looking for. They're all right answers. So this is a world dominated by fear. Right? Now, if you were to work on your nervous system to the point where a 3 out of 10 was a 3 out of 10, and keep going, and go up a mountain for 20 years, and keep going, and keep going, to the point where you could actually have a lion walk in the room, and all you're doing is worrying about the health of that pussycat. You would be turning a 9 out of 10 almost into a 1 out of 10. How would you experience the world from that place? Trust. 
trust, safe. Who said love? Joy. Love. And what would happen if you transformed the world from fear to love? I mean, I think that every great spiritual tradition on this planet has really been selling that message, haven't they? And if, uh, the way I understand it, they all have, on the one hand, a set of rules about how to live. <coughs> Thou shalt not X, Y, or Z. Boundaries and containment. And on the other hand, they have a set of practices about how to recover. Right? Mindfulness, meditation, prayer, chanting, whirling dervishes. These are non-cognitive activities. And if you live in one of these communities, you have to do both. And if you do, the idea is that you transform fear to love. So there's the Brexit uh, illusion of the day. I'm afraid that you know, politics these days has made everyone very afraid. We all need to regulate ourselves to come back into love. I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>